the right tools and opportunities, young people thrive in making the world a better place. Speak up. Let your voice be a catalyst for change. The time to act is now. Look at this. Wow. Good, morning. Good morning. Thank you all for coming back. Wow. It's good that you knew that yesterday evening was only the beginning. Yeah. I'm grateful that they all showed back up. Welcome, everybody. Did you get a good night's sleep? <laughs> no. All of that jet lag we talked about yesterday is taken care of now, yes? We're fully rested, and I can tell by the number of empty seats that no one is still sleeping. So that's good. Uh, good morning. It's great to see you all. Uh, my name is Ashley. I spoke with you all briefly last evening. And I'm Mike, and uh, I'm last minute standing today, so uh, bear with me. I was going to say, me. Antonio, you're looking, uh, you're looking a bit different. A bit different, than what I a bit more British. Yeah, a bit uh, less laka, a bit more British. Yeah, but. Um, yeah, 8 o'clock this morning I found out that I'd be with you, but it's an absolute pleasure. Um, in my spare time, I'm the event manager for YMCA 175, so... All of this. <laughs> in, in his spare time, he says, which means that as a last-minute uh, stand-in co-host, his entire team right now is without Mike, which means they're handling all of the Mike problems. So if you see any of the Y175 team, just give them a hug. Just a nice hug. Actually, could we make some noise for the amazing volunteers from all over the world that have been making this event possible? I see some of them as well in blue t-shirts. The YMCA has uh, an incredibly rich history and culture of volunteerism and service, and what you will see for this entire week is a conference room or conference facility full of people who have made it their, their effort and devoted so many months to making this event happen, and it's really incredible. For this event that is run by multiple countries uh, to be put together and to have everyone, everyone's voices represented, so we're really excited to be here and excited to kick off this morning plenary. We um, cannot wait for you to dive into the nearly 300 hours yes. of workshops that are going to be led by young leaders from all over the world. And you all have to go to all 300 of those hours of content. <laughs> there will be quizzes afterward. <laughs> um, yes, very thoughtfully put together by, by Y teams from all over the world. You're, you can check in your uh, Y app 
which I believe has descriptions of all of those sessions in it. Yeah. All the sessions, all the speakers, all in the app. And don't worry, I will give you some app updates at the end of the opening plenary. Somehow, and luckily for us, we have the guy who knows all of the app updates right here. Yeah. Um, so without any further ado, I think we can kick off this morning's session. What do you say? I absolutely think we should work it. welcome our first are you, are you ready? speaker. I am ready, and I'm super excited. Uh, so we talked a bit last night when, when I was up here about the fact that this is not the first global event the YMCA has done, nor is it the second or even the hundredth, right? But this is one of the first events where we have a lineup of young people who are leading change, not just within the YMCA movement, but around the world. So you're going to hear from young voices of people who are not preparing to be leaders someday when they grow up and that magical switch flips and we go from being the leaders of the future to being the leaders of today. Because we here at the Y know that that switch is not actually a thing. It's not a thing. It's not a thing. You're already making it happen. Yeah. So kicking us off this morning is a, a young woman who I've had the pleasure of getting to know briefly backstage, along with her adorable daughter, who is right there and very cute. Um, <laughs> and we are really excited to have her with us today. Um, Christine is a serial entrepreneur, which means that even for somebody who is so young, she's already been a leader specifically in Haiti. She's from Port-au-Prince, uh, where she started off as, as a street vendor and discovered that you could learn quite a lot about how to run a business by doing the work that she was doing. And in her spare time, like many of our Y leaders here, we find lots of productive ways to spend our spare time. Christine decided to teach herself how to code and then to launch her first online training business. She's a serial keynote speaker, and when she got married and had her first child, she realized that traveling was no longer as easy. So instead of traipsing around the world, she said, okay, I can still teach people if I teach myself how to code and build a website. So here to share with us a little bit of her story and to pose some questions about how you all want to be active participants in your futures is Christine and Tim. Take it away. So hello, everyone. Are you with me? Hello, everyone. There we have it. So as stated, my name is Christine and Tim. But at count of three, I want you to scream as loud as you can your name so I could get to know all of you. You guys ready for this? Yes. On a count of three, one, two, three. Yeah. Whoa, sounds like an awesome crowd. Thank you for introducing yourself. And I'm going to need you to do this several times. So anytime I ask this simple question, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want you to scream your name. What do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. It's not the typical answer you would expect, right? I'm sure back in the day when someone asked you this very question, you might have said, I want to be a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant. You know, the jobs that mom and dad want you to bring on the money, right? But with the world changes so quickly, what happens when these jobs go away, right? We all know what's happening right now with technology and the digital revolution, but the same jobs our moms and dads once have, we don't have them today. And some of you might already be aware of that, and you're prepared. So maybe you're not inspired by titles anymore, so you're inspired by the people. And so some of you might be following celebrities. Maybe I could be a tech mogul and launch a company like Facebook, or a politician making policy for nations or celebrities. But even our definition of leadership is changing. We're being led by all of you in this room. So what happens when even your leaders don't inspire you? What happens then? And the reason why I'm asking you guys these questions is because I'm sure you're gonna hear a lot of talks over the next couple of days about the challenges we're facing as a society today. Because ladies and gentlemen, we do have challenges as a society. There's a lot that needs to be done. But when I think about what's happening around the world, I think to myself, of course, they would tell you, we have a plan. I'm sure you've seen this before, right? The SDG goals. And people will tell you, the adults in the room, mom and dad, 
are making the right agreements and the partnerships to find solutions for this. But I don't know about you, if you watch history, when I think about change makers who really are catalysts to make things happen, I think about you guys. Whether it's the civil rights movement that happened in America, to the riots that were happening in Tiananmen Square in Asia, to the student riots that was happening right here in London for Europe to inspire people to do better with the Vietnam War, so even the Arab Spring in the Middle East that inspired an entire generation about the power of social media. Young people have always been at the forefront of innovation, movement, and inspiring our adults to do better. And inspiring people to think and really be inclusive about the solutions that they're bringing to light. And so when I think about these movements, sometimes they start very small. But at the heart of these movements, I want to make sure that you understand your place and really inspiring change, and really motivating people to do the right thing. And when you think about this, I'm going to ask you one more time, what do you want to be when you grow up? I hope that you always say that. Because when you think about those who are skeptical and think that they're not the right people to really inspire change, I bring you to the Dalai Lama, where he says, if you do not think, and if you think that you're too small to make a difference, Try sleeping with a mosquito in the room. And we know as young people, we're persistent. We're stop stoppable. We have the energy and the fire to make things happen. And so how do you hold yourself accountable to inspire the people around you to do better, right? And so when you think about these things, I'm sure you might think you need to be famous to make a change. You don't need to be known. I'm sure you never heard of Dylan. Nine years old, at that age, he was inspiring three million people around the world to tackle those challenges that we were talking about earlier today, right? And of course, I'm sure when you think about gender equality and the future of education, you already know Malala. At a tender age, her ability to defy the odds, she has inspired not only young people around the world, but people with huge titles to see things differently about this generation. And again, you don't have to stop. You can always inspire people even after you're done doing your time. Because Anne Frank will considerably always remind us that we need to do better with our dignity and do better in humanity, right? That we owe our fellow men and women better when it comes to doing right by those around us. And so every single day, I am amazed, not by those political leaders or those business leaders that people tell you are starting these movements. I'm inspired by what you are doing in this room. And sometimes people will challenge you and tell you that you're not the one that's gonna really make a change because you're too young. But this world, as big as it is, one person can be the tipping scale to really create a domino effect that no one ever seen coming. Yesterday, when I saw what happened in this room, the conga line that was going all over the room, there was one person who started it. No one listened, then two, then three, then four. All of a sudden, there wasn't even enough room to contain what happened here last night. That's what young people do. We don't wait for permission. We just go. Right? We just go. And when you see what's happening in the world, it's very easy for you to get lost and think that you don't know what perspective should I take? What, how can I lead? What should I do? You're going to ask yourself these hard questions. I'm going to bring you back to the question you should always ask yourself and you should have the right answer. What do you want to be when you grow up? Now with all the people in this world, it's very easy to think that you're not unique. Because we all want human race, that I know. But each one of you have a distinct fingerprint that makes you unique. And it's not just your biological makeup, it's also your story. What is your story? What defines you? What makes you the unique soul that you are on this planet to create real change? Do you know your story? Do you share with others? Do you tell people what you've been through, what you've seen, and how you view the world so they can connect and be inspired? But what you've been through, let me tell you my story, okay? Now, how many of you in the room have heard about the earthquake that hit Haiti in 2010? Practically all of you, right? On that day, a quarter of a million people perished. The largest devastation in human history. 
right? A quarter of a million Pat people Prize. And on that day, of course, there was a lot of sensationalized news all over about the devastation, the political unrest, everything that was happening in Haiti. But no one was showing the people their resilience, their culture, the beauty and grace of how people on the next day got back up and showed a different narrative. Now, when I think about women like this one, a street vendor who actually not only woke up the next day and got right back to business, but even used the rubble to actually showcase her goods. And the reason why this resonated with me, because I actually grew up as a street vendor. In the streets of Haiti, alongside my mother and my grandmother, we come from a long generation line of women who sold in the streets, whether it was food, products around the world. Despite my Ivy League education, being a banker immediately after college, I still quit because I was fascinated by street vendors and street markets around the world. And for those of you who don't respect street vendors when you see them, you're in for a rude awakening. Because the economy as it stands, I know a lot of people will tell you about the stock market and the formal economy, but business happens here. This is where business is happening around the world. And uh, to think about this, there is about 4 billion people on this planet that make a living selling goods on these streets. And let me tell you something, when you find your truth, when you're passionate about something, even the crazies will have to follow and listen to what you have to say. Because again, I said this before, you do not need permission to actually do something. I hear a lot of young people today always ask us, I'll have this idea, what do you think? Who cares? Who cares what people think about what you want to do? If you have an idea in your head, you are blessed by the grace of God to have the idea, you go for it. Because people will start to listen. And I've met people from around the world, from presidents to celebrities all over. As crazy as they think I am to talk about street vendors, they listen. So again, when you think about these things, people start to listen. And that year, not only did I make the Forbes list and became 30 on the 30, my business that I created to start this movement to empower street vendors around the world became a business case study for Harvard Business School. Where not only students around the world are studying what we did to start a movement, but even those business leaders, those CEOs, are trying to figure out what we did as young children on the streets of Haiti. That's what happens when you believe in your own truth. And so again, what do you want to be when you grow up? You're getting better at this. Because when I ask you this question, I want you to confidently answer your name. Because like I said before, you are unique in many ways. It's your story. And unfortunately, in this day and age, we're not just defined by how we look. We're also defined by the cultures we represent. Last night, we were inspired, the ceremony of the flags, where I saw people got emotional in this room to see their flag being waved. The flag I wave is Haiti. Don't be fooled by my American accent. Yes, I'm a New Yorker born at heart. So you feel that swag. But I'm also Haitian for my Haitian sisters and Caribbean sisters in the room. And when you find your grace and your truth, keep in mind you represent every single person that also looks like you. And like I said, when I think about Haiti, people will tell you, this is Haiti. That narrative stops right here. That is not Haiti. And nothing that people tell you about Haiti, if they want to tell you it's poor, they have no actual legitimate government, all the negative things you hear about Haiti, this is Haiti. The first black republic that a lot of nations in this room owe their existence to, this is Haiti. Our beauty, our culture, and our resilience, this is Haiti. And when I think about what inspired me to really represent my country, I thought to myself, I don't have the titles of some of the people in this room. I don't. I might not even have the influence of some of these people in this room. But I have the heart to understand that the world is changing very fast. I understand technology. And I said, what would happen if we started something, a tech movement around Haiti to rebrand the country? And we launched Haiti Tech Summit in 2017. And let me tell you something, I didn't want, I did not go to the decision makers. I refused because they wouldn't listen. Because a lot of times people who are experts will tell you all the reasons why you can't do what you can do. And for me to see that, I'm like, hmm, 
Your lack of success has no definition of what I could do. You need to remember that. And so I went to my peers. A lot of times we overthink our fellow mates. The person to your left and to your right might be the best partner in crime that you need to make a difference in this world. That's your partner in crime. And so I went to my peers, I went to my friends, I said, let's make this movement happen. All under 30 years old, and this is what happened. The adults came, the presidents came, the celebrities came, people from around the world, people like Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, came to Haiti for the first time. All the major companies, all the major media outlets were in Haiti. And every year since, people are shocked to find out that this is the real Haiti that they never saw. Despite this country being around for 215 years, this is the first time they saw Haiti differently. And I realized that once you start to, again, find your grace and find your truth, you have an accountability to do more and do better and keep that grace going. Because again, my work did not stop there. I started thinking again, what do you want to be when you grow up? I asked myself that question again. Am I going to stop at Haiti when I know as a Haitian American, the way I look, the way I present myself to you today, I am also of African descent. To all my brothers and sisters across the continent, I represent where these people come from too. And this narrative about Africa, people will tell you that they think they know what Africa is. And they never even been to the beautiful parts of Africa. There are places on Africa that will put the world to shame because it's so gorgeous. People are shocked. Back in 2000, The Economist, a respectable organization, a media platform, said Africa, the hopeless continent. Can you believe this? I guess they changed their tune now. Africa rising. This just shows you the power of narrative where when you start creating movements, how many of you have been seeing Afro beats? You're seeing people rocking their garments from across the continent. So now when you see someone of African descent, you think differently. And so I say, you know what? To my mom and dad in the audience, Mr. and Mrs. Bannerman and Tim, my family from Ghana, we said we got to go beyond Haiti and go to the first black republic on the African continent. We went to Ghana. Where are my Ghanaians in the house? We went to Ghana, because Ghana is also another inspirational part for the world. And when we saw what was happening in Ghana, again, we didn't wait to go to the decision makers. We went to our peers. This happened. And people were shocked to see Ghana, a tech hub. Maybe this might make sense. And so, of course, we don't stop there. This year, we're traveling to 11 countries across the continent and bringing this message to Liberia, to Egypt, Rwanda, South Africa. We're going across the African continent. And every single time you get to the point where people are shocked and realize like, wow, now I need to listen because now we're across 20 countries this year. So what happened in 2017? One summit in Haiti shocked people. Last year we did 11 summits building country brands around the world, shocked people. This year, 20 summits around the world and nations across the African continent. Next year, we already have 53 tech summits scheduled across the world. So again, I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, for the last time, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because there's a certain point where you realize you never need a permission that you are just downright unstoppable. Now, you got to tell people this Chinese proverb, the person who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the person who is actually doing it. Now you're unstoppable. So when you're at that point, I would like to remind people, there's going to be a lot of people that's going to judge you and tell you you're too naive, you're too young, you're too inexperienced. Well, guess what? That sounds like a hell of a resume to me. That's the best resume you could ever have. Because when they tell you you're too naive, good. You'll be bolder than the people who've done it before you to make it happen. When they tell you you're too young, 
perfect. You'll have the energy and the fire to keep going. And when they tell you you're too experienced, by God's grace, you're going to tell people, I'm going to make history because you're now unstoppable. And so again, when I ask you for the last time, what do you want to be when you grow up? I hope when you hear this question that your answer will always be that. Be yourself. Because when I think about the problems that we're going to go through as a society and what we're dealing with every single day, I am inspired by the fact that each and every one of you should never say that the answer to that question is someone that you ever heard, met, or heard before. The answer to that question will always be you. You're the inspiration that the world needs. And when I think about the fact that, yes, there are about 7 billion people on this planet, that is 7 billion reasons why I have hope for the future and why I have hope for what each and every one of you could do to make the world a better place. And so, again, don't just change the world. Please. Be yourself and give people the grace and the beauty that makes you unique and what you could do for this planet. And go ahead and rock this world because the world needs you right now. I wish you the best and I cannot wait to see how each and every one of you will soar. Thank you so much, everyone. What an amazing way to start our opening plenary. And I think the message is very clear. It's people like you that make it happen. I've been thinking a lot about Christine's question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And we were chatting backstage about the fact that oftentimes for, for both of us, our answers to that question as we were growing up are much different than what we have ended up doing. I don't know uh, that what I'm doing right now is at all like what I wanted to do when I was younger, or what I thought I wanted to do when I was younger. But here's a little bit about how it's gone. So. I did youth in government with the YMCA and discovered that 
I had a voice and I loved it. And then I got to work with the YMCA and do civic engagement and leadership development and help other young people discover that they could make change in their communities. Now, I work for TED, which is an organization that I always loved growing up, and the work that I get to do is building our global student talks program, which means that we work with young people all over the globe to develop and share their own ideas in the form of TED style talks. Because when TED began, TED stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. And when it began, it was a small conference uh, with a small number of people, and just out of curiosity, what do you all think those people looked like? Old white men. Somebody, I heard somebody say that. Uh, yup. <laughs> and as it turns out, and you know, we, as, as it turns out, there are lots of other people that have ideas worth spreading. Like who? Yes, everyone, including the people in this room, especially just like Christine mentioned, young people. So because I knew, I had the very fortunate position of being able to know the, the work that the Y was doing all over the world and to learn about young people that are affecting change and making a difference in their communities. As soon as I started at TED, I thought, okay, we're gonna try and bring some of these stories to the main stage. So what you're gonna see for the next several days in morning plenaries and throughout um, workshops are a handful of speakers who have gone through the program that I and my team work on at TED, the TED Masterclass program, which is a course that helps you develop your idea and share it. And they are now TED Ed speakers. So you'll hear from a handful of young people that are a part of your community, a part of my community, this global movement for young people, by young people. And we are gonna try really hard for the next few days to make sure that we see exactly, that we hear from those young people about exactly what they're doing so that if it's something you wanna get involved with, if it's something that inspires you, you can do that too. So I'm really excited to bring to the stage our very uh, first TED Ed speaker um, from right here in England. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Natalie Chung. Hello everyone and welcome to London. <laughs> My name is Natalie Chung and I'm a civil engineer. So who here knows what civil engineering is? A couple of people, not bad. Well, speaking to friends and family, I've realized that very few people do. Women make up only 12% of engineers and technicians in the UK workforce. 12%. In a world where women make up 50% of the population, 12% is way too low. And it's the lowest in the whole of Europe. I had no idea what engineering was until I was about 15. What I didn't realize is that engineering is all around us. It's in electricity. It's in this fabric. It's in the chairs that you're all sitting on. Who here has a phone? Thank you. Engineering has contributed to every tiny part that makes up your phone. Even this building. This building and every other building was designed by a civil engineer. Engineers design things that are used by all people, people from all walks of life. But so many people can't imagine themselves becoming an engineer because they believe some of the myths and stereotypes that they've heard about it. As part of quality education and quality employment, young people need to know the opportunities that they have. But today I won't only be talking about engineering, I will be talking about STEM. Science, technology, engineering and maths. STEM. At the age of 17, I was the only girl in my physics class. I was the only girl in my computing class. And I was the only girl in my maths class. In the UK, many students select just a few classes that they will take on and study between the ages of 16 and 18. 
Looking at data collected in 2017, only 27% of girls' class entries were in STEM subjects. Compare that with 46% of boys' class entries. Gender underrepresentation is particularly pronounced in physics and computing. Physics classes are made up of only 22% girls. Computing classes are only made up of 10% girls. I know from first-hand experience, from being there in the classroom, that this isn't just a bunch of statistics. This is real life. In my school, girls and boys were split into different classes until the age of 16. So it was quite a shock to the system when I joined classes where suddenly I was the only girl. It was a huge difference to me. When I was at school, I was always very confident in maths for the first 10 years that I was at school. But that all changed when I joined a class of all boys at 16. I completely lost my confidence. The boys would be speeding through the textbook, and the teacher would ask, does anyone need any help? Do I need to go through another example? And the boys would say, no, 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 I've got it. What? I needed more support than that. I used to stay back after classes and ask the teacher so many questions. I wanted to understand every single example. In math, there's often a right answer and a wrong answer, and I wanted to make sure that I got the exact right answer every single time. Maybe it's not the case that girls have any less ability in maths, but rather that we don't have the confidence in our ability. We need to build our confidence in our ability to show that we can achieve just the same. We also have a societal perception that science and maths are very hard. My younger sister is currently 14 years old. She's starting to choose between different classes at school now. Her school advised her that biology is the easiest of all the science subjects. They advise that physics and chemistry are much, much harder. And they advise that physics and chemistry are only for the top, highest achieving students. This is not true. There is so much wrong with this. But this matches up with the perception that we have in society of scientists and engineers. Think of a famous scientist or a famous mathematician. Who do you think of? Albert Einstein? Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, maybe Stephen Hawking. Whoever you think of, they were all considered the brains of our generation. And you may notice that they're all men. These are the scientists and the mathematicians that we learn about in school. Let me be clear to you, you don't need to be Einstein to understand science. We have this perception that you need to be a total genius Maybe you need to be a little eccentric. Maybe you need to be a complete nerd. In the movies, it's always a complete nerd who has no social skills. But in reality, scientists and other STEM professionals work together in teams with other people to achieve their goals. They do have social skills. And they didn't all get good grades at school. So if anyone ever told you that a path in STEM is not open to you, they're wrong. We need to be able to question science topics and consider evidence. We need to be critical thinkers. We need to be confident in our ability to use maths in our everyday lives. It's important for quality education and quality employment, but it isn't only important for school and careers. It's also important for our livelihoods, our freedom and as agents of change. When you're at a restaurant with friends and the check comes, who splits the bill? I have a lot of friends who always say, no, 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 I can't do it, I can't do maths, you sort it out. And this happens all over the world. When I was volunteering in Zambia, I was inspired by young women who were learning maths and numeracy skills through a local charity. The charity was empowering the young women to do their own budgeting. And this means that for the first time, they could have financial independence, financial freedom. They were no longer tied to their fathers and their husbands as they had been traditionally. We need to be science 
literate. We are in a time when young people are creating change in communities all over the world. Many of the world's young leaders are right here in this room. Well done to yourselves. Young people need to understand the challenges that face our generation and the generations to come. By being science literate, we can understand genetically modified foods. We can understand online data protection, vaccines, abortions, climate change. Climate change is an example of a global challenge that affects us all. And we need to join in the discussion. Young people like you, like us, need to join in the discussion. And we need to be science literate to do this. I'm not saying that everyone needs to be a scientist or an engineer. Not at all. Keep doing what you're already doing. But when you are making change in your communities, have an appreciation for STEM in our everyday lives. Understand where STEM skills can be useful. Tell people that you met an engineer today. Me, one that just happens to be a woman. Don't shy away from the stem behind global challenges like health, like climate change. Inspire and empower the next generation of stem. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a question. Come this way with me. Oh, hello. Thank you. So, okay. I will say, I have to ad admit firstly, w for a moment, when you said online data protection, <laughs> I thought you said online dating protection. Data. And I, <laughs> I think both are important. Very important. <laughs> to be clear. Um, I'm curious to know, so maybe you all have had the experience that Natalie mentioned of being the only blank in your, in Natalie's case, class, right? How, what advice would you have or what, what motivated you to stick through all of those classes despite being the only, the only girl in this class? I'm wary about telling people to lean in when actually it should be the wider systems that should be changing to accommodate and include all people. But for you to succeed, yep. it's true. <laughs> But for you to succeed in the systems that you have now, my motivations all come from the impact that it will have with real people. So in my profession, civil engineering, it is something that affects the general public. It is something that all people can understand. Who here got on the public transport and the trains to get here today? I did. Yeah. If civil engineers didn't work on those train stations and those railways, we wouldn't have that public transport that get people from A to B whether that's to school, to see their families, or to work, or something else. So that's my motivation. And I think that's something that a lot of you will be able to understand as well, being able to have work that has great impact on other people's lives. Ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause for Natalie. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Such a pleasure to have Natalie here with us. Only last November, Natalie won Young Leader of the Year Award at YMCA's National Award Ceremony here in London. She's a real slacker, that Natalie. And it was the first time I met her, and I said, have you heard about this event we're planning next August? And no. Well, <laughs> just a few months later, a keynote st speaker on the main stage. That's sometimes how it happens, right? Just like Christine said. Uh, and one further note on, I'm very grateful to London civil engineers for making this public transportation system as easy as it is. I've lived in New York and San Francisco and traveled around. London knows how to do public transportation. It was very easy. So thank you all for that. <laughs> um, continuing on the theme of discovering young leadership and asking people to share their stories and connecting it back to the theme of this incredibly rich movement that we've had, the history that we've learned so much about, that we've seen snippets from or of from the, the play that you all saw this morning and last night. Want to bring up the next, uh, the next speaker who 
she herself has such a fascinating story that is multi-generational that involves the YMCA in the Philippines. Please welcome to the stage, Tintin. All yours. Good morning. My hometown, Albay, is one of the smallest yet disaster-prone province in the Philippines. It is situated along the Pacific Ring of Fire and the Typhoon Belt, which means it is the part of the Pacific wherein volcanic eruptions and earthquake occurs. Each year, we are exposed to more or less 20 cyclones, with which three of them directly hit our province. In 2006, Mount Mayon volcano have been erupting for several months. It is a perfect cone-shaped volcano located right at the center of the entire province. Later that year, a series of extreme typhoons devastated the entire province. It aggravated a massive mud flow from the volcano, submerging the entire villages, killing more than 1,000 people displaced 13,000 families, left homeless and without livelihoods. I saw children and women begging for food in the streets. They were living in tents for months and years. There were no toilets, not even clean drinking water. Schools were turned into evacuation centers and others were buried underground, including their farms and other sources of livelihood. That disaster marked the second life of Albay YMCA because it was closed for more than 20 years. Our building was burned and no attempt from the old management to rebuild the YMCA. It became a dumping ground of garbage and a place for squatters to stay. But because that disaster in Albay made the international news, our province was in the state of calamity. International aids came in, and one was YMCA. I volunteered during the relief distribution and repair of shelters project. Old members of the YMCA reached out when they started to notice the YMCA back. Starting from scratch was never easy. But because the people needed food, shelter, livelihood. We continue to pursue the mission of the YMCA to serve our fellow Albayanos who are in need. I write proposals for the rehabilitation while rebuilding my YMCA on the side. After a year, we were able to provide livelihood opportunities for the displaced people and safe spaces for children. And now, my YMCA serving more than 3,000 people annually, and we are a recognized partner of the local government and other institutions in transforming lives and communities. I hope... Thank you. I hope my story will inspire and motivate you and other organizations who are starting anew. Believe that if you have the passion, commitment, hard work and network, you will always find hope in every beginning, just like Albay YMCA. Thank you. I want to ask you, one, ask you something really quickly. Uh, so I, I love stories of regeneration and when we were in rehearsal yesterday you know Tintin came in late because she was had travel woes like many people here and she came you know came in and and we had already kind of started and I asked her to introduce herself and will you just share a little bit about about what you said you know your your grandfather oh yes yeah. I said uh, YMCA is in my DNA. That's the <laughs> first thing she said. <laughs> actually, is the founder of our YMCA in 1953, but he left because he became a UN consultant. So I never knew YMCA while doing that. 
So three generations of YMCA. So three generations of of humans in a particular place dealing with a particular set of struggles, but having this structure, this this support network through the YMCA. And I just loved so much what you said when, when you're introducing yourself because, and you could feel it in, I mean, you all can feel it now, I'm sure, but, but in the room yesterday, you could just feel her passion and her love for this organization. And she said, it's in my blood. And I so respect and admire the work that you're doing. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to stick with this particular region of the world for just a bit longer, specifically with the Philippines. Um, I, I am excited to introduce this next young woman because her work fascinates me because I know nothing about it. Well, not nothing, but she does healthcare policy. And she discovered this work because she started doing volunteer work through, you know, connected to her YMCA in the Philippines and discovered that people that she was trying to serve didn't have enough information to be able to receive the services that her work was meant to provide. So she set out on this path to help figure out how to close those understanding gaps for the citizens in the Philippines that she was trying to serve and the policies and services that she was trying to enact. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming this brilliant young lady, Alisa. Hi. It has only been a year after I graduated and my first day in work, but I noticed something, and I wanted to do something about it. It was July 16, 2018, when I started my very first job, after graduating from college with a degree of applied mathematics. It was a shock for me since I will be entering a government agency, and that is the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, or PhilHealth, which caters more than 90% of the Filipinos' health care. As part of the training, my task is to receive all the incoming documents, both from internal and external sources. What caught my eye is the never-ending complaint, at an average of 10 complaints per day. These complaints came from the poor marginalized sector of our country, asking us, PhilHealth, why they didn't get the benefits that they deserve. I also wondered and asked myself about these questions. Let me start off by giving you a brief background of the healthcare in the Philippines. Around 20 years ago, the Philippine government only spends 4.7% of its total budget to health expenditure, despite having the fact that the mortality rate is about 6.1%. That's why the National Health Insurance Program was born for all the Filipinos. This program carries the social solidarity. This means that those who, can, those who are healthy and can pay for their medical expenses can subsidize and help the poor. But still, there is a gradual increase in the number of deaths in the Philippines, and it was commonly seen in the poor and rural areas of the country. According to World Health Organization, equity is the quality of being fair and impartial among groups of people. And when you say health equity, it simply refers to equity in health, or ideally, everyone have the potential to attain their full health potential. With this kind of definitions, has the Philippine government really achieved health equity? Why is it really important to attain health equity? First, it increases life expectancy rate. If the poor and the rural areas experiencing what the privileged ones are experiencing right now, then they could have lived at 10 or 20 years from now. Second, it can create harmonious environment and, a, uh, and it can create a healthy country which will be good for the economy also. Lastly, it will lead to another notion or concept of equity 
It will not be health but equity in general, which will be useful for us young people for the next generation to come. From the time I started working up to this time, I, I get a clear picture of what was missing. We lack effective communication. We lack information sharing and connectivity to our members. We keep on doing things, activities, gathering them, sharing them all the benefits that they could get, but then I realize they cannot digest all that information in just one event. They want sustainability. They want continuity of information sharing. Also, we lack the connectivity between the speaker and the audience. The speaker keeps on telling and sharing about technical and medical jargons which, we, which the layman cannot understand. It is in this setting that got me thinking, how can I help those people? How can I help them not, got, not be cheated and scammed by other people, especially now that the Philippines is aiming for a universal healthcare system for all? I am aiming for a Philippines where the, the Filipinos will have a free access to their healthcare services and that no one will be shy to ask his or her family or other people to support their financial, uh, financial and medical needs. I want the young people to, be, to see the importance of health equity and be the catalyst for promoting this health equity. Now that I work in this industry, in the government, and as I volunteer in the YMCA, I am thinking of ways on how can I help these people. First, in my work as a social health insurance officer, I want to inform all those Filipinos, especially the young people, on how to process, avail, and claim their benefits in the, in the language that they will be able to understand it. Second, as part of the Philippine YMCA community and health being one of the four major trusts of my local YMCA, I want to take part in influencing more young people to live healthy by conducting healthy living seminars, information dissemination activities, and building partnerships between the YMCA, the government, and maybe the private companies which offers health insurance as well. If I engage more young people, it will be a domino effect. And the information will continue to pass through until it reaches all the Filipinos so that they will know what they deserve. And that is a quality health service. In closing, I want to share with you this message from the Philippine Secretary of Health. That health is everyone's business. Health systems only works together if everyone is working together to ensure that no one is left behind. Let us all be healthy and serve the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What I love about uh, Alisa's talk is that there is often a disconnect between the inspirational things that we talk about when we get together in groups like this and the practical things that have to be done to do the work that we need to do. Yes. And you, you, I love the way that you talked about the very practical approaches and strategies and goals that you have to do the work that you're doing. Yes, it's really information. It's really about the language that we will use in informing them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So thank you so much for giving us a little bit of insight thank you so much. to your world. Thank, thank you. you. Well, there are our first three TED-Ed speakers and vitally important stories. Um, so important, in fact, that I would like to recognize and welcome the present, uh, presence of uh, Madam President from the United Nations General Assembly. Thank you for joining us to listen to those stories. Very shortly, we'll be hearing from Madam President herself. Uh, but before that, uh, an issue that has been splashed across the news more increasingly over the last 12 months with movements like clim uh, School Strike for Climate Justice and Greta Thunberg, <laughs> who I think is an incredible... Oh, have you all heard of her? You've heard of her then. Cool. 
But climate is one of the most critical issues that is facing our planet, and we have to do more about it. And I think that Morgan Freeman's going to talk to us a little bit more about that. <laughs> one day, we will wake up to find that the energy that powers the alarm clock came from the breeze through the trees the night before. And we will go to work that morning riding the rays of the sun. It will light our cities and power our businesses. It will warm our homes and cool our workplaces. It will reduce sources of conflict and fuel our economies. It will connect us all. It won't scar the land or poison the seas. The food we eat will be good for our bodies and good for the planet. And the weather that day won't make us worry for tomorrow. There will be more jobs and less disease. The sea level will stop rising. And species will stop dying. The question is, how do we get to that day from where we are today? All 7.3 billion of us. We start by deciding that beyond our doubts and differences, such a day truly exists. And that is something each of us can do today. We can make today the day we stop thinking that the changes required to get there are impossible and beyond us, and start realizing that they are not only possible, but what the future requires of us. We must stop turning from the warnings of science and fear and denial and instead turn toward the solutions and partnerships we need. We can make today the day we stop pointing at each other in blame and instead chart a new course together. We have never faced a crisis this big, but we have never had a better opportunity to solve it. We have everything we need to wake up to a different kind of world. We need our leaders to be brave and their choices to be bold. They will either remember us as the generation that destroyed its home or the one that finally came to respect it. We have every reason in the world to act. We can't wait until tomorrow. This is our only home. You can choose today to make a world of difference. Morgan. <clears throat> and I'd just like to briefly talk about the sustainability at YMCA 175, because it's something that we took very much to heart when we were planning the entirety of the event. Yeah. Your lanyards around your neck are made completely from recycled plastic. You'll notice we opted for paper badges. We don't have a single bottle of water made out of plastic on sale inside our event spaces. <clears throat> The water coolers are stocked with recyclable, recyclable paper cones. Your dinner plates are made out of palm leaves, again, that are compostable. Your food waste will go to the largest wormery in the UK, with 300,000 worms on site here. It's right underneath right us. Underneath it's right us. underneath us. There's a lot of worms under there. It's really cool. So we have really tried our best, but we also know that the events industry is not perfect and must do more. And so we do want to hear your feedback throughout the events. 
And for the future, we need to work with our partners. We need to work with our contractors to go further and do more so that mass events like this have the lowest possible impact that they can. Yeah. And on that note, we've been so fortunate to work with not just the UN in terms of this event, but also in our own wise, there's been an incredible amount of overlap, lots of focus on sustainability and climate justice. And we are fortunate to have a, a practiced um, academic in that field to share a little bit with us today. Uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to bring out our next speaker, Paula Molisa. Hello, everyone. I'm looks have a comment up. When they look at me, the crown of Lysia. When they look at all ancestors, everyone will stop of Lysia. When they look at me, everyone will stop, you will stop the sacred ground. Uh, good Hello, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to make an initial acknowledgement. It's such a huge honor to be part of this event, YMCA 175. Uh, my name is Paula Melissa. I'm from the Pacific Island nation of Vanuatu. Uh, it used to be called the Old New Hebrides back in the day, uh, when it was a colony under uh, the British and the French condominium. So there are some very deep uh, relationships between Vanuatu and England. Uh, there's also some very deep relationships between uh, the church bringing the book uh, to Vanuatu and also bringing those prophetic traditions of social justice, of ecological sensibility, and of solidarity with the oppressed, all that also came along uh, with that colonial history. So just making that initial acknowledgement, I wanted to recognize those histories, uh, those histories of liberation struggle, and that's also the ethos uh, that YMCA, George Williams, his vision uh, was founded on from the start. So again, uh, thank you very much. It's a huge honor to be here and uh, look forward to the Q&A with Ash and uh, Mike. Join, join us oh. in our living room, please. <laughs> Sit on our AstroTurf couch. Tell me about what okay. you've got here. Oh. This is, uh, I come from, I come from uh, two major regions in Vanuatu. This is my mother's, uh, you know, in any, any of our indigenous traditions, there's different artistic practices that capture the, the wisdom traditions and the, the ancient mysteries of, of our people. And this is specifically a, a women's sacred practice, mat weaving. And the patterns, um, they're all passed down through the generations. Uh, and this particular one comes from my great-grandmother, -gra my grandmother, sorry, who was one of our master weavers. And the spiral pattern and the colors. Um, I'm also a therapist, and one of the, when I work with people uh, to deal with whatever issues they're working with in terms of chronic stress or physical, emotional, uh, illnesses, I call it the spiral path because, uh, and it comes from, it, it, the name itself comes from this particular pattern, and I call it the spiral path because um, as I've also done environmental work, I've come to realize that um, if you really look deeply at all our different forms of major global ecological crisis, it really stems from disconnection from our heart. Um, all our social systems, the ones that are producing all these different forms of ecological destruction because of the relentless growth, for instance, that comes out of capitalism, it's actually disconnection. We can't fit, the, the social systems put barriers in place for us to actually feel the impact that we have on the earth. 
And one of the ways that a lot of our people uh, learn to live in balance with the natural world is by developing all these practices where our feelings to the natural world, to the oceans, to the rivers, and also to each other. We stay connected by always tapping into this. Um, hence, I kind of take this around with me. It's also a way of acknowledging that all our, most of our innovative ideas, they've got ancient roots. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why I really love how our opening ceremony also honored the history of YMCA going back to Sir George and all the others who founded, uh, founded these, these organizations that are now global. Um, it's again, peoples. and it's again reconnecting back to our, our past. Yeah. Not, not to stay stuck in it, but to take those perennial principles, those essential principles, those timeless principles, and to adapt them for the modern world so we can face our own current challenges. So I wonder, I think this is beautiful, and I, I think probably most of our cultures have some equivalent of this. So I am from the southeastern United States, and um, and back, you know, during the time of, of slavery, women in the southeastern United States would quilt, and they would communicate. They would their quilting patterns would communicate their feelings about the natural world, and then also communicate with other, yeah. you know, because they there there wasn't literacy for reading and writing, but so they built these structures as ways of communicating with each other and about the world. And what I'm curious about, because you have this very fascinating background that connects both academia and, uh, and these heart-centered practices, uh, I'm curious to know or for you to share with, with our audience about what took you from academic practice to the work that you now do in therapy? Um, so my, my academic work was more of an accident anyway. This is a theme uh, we're hearing today. So I, I mean, when I went to uni, I went to uni in New Zealand to Victoria University of Wellington. I studied, <laughs> I studied law and accounting. Um, and, but really, to be honest, I had no interest at all in academia. I did it because mum and dad thought law and accounting might be good career paths. I just wanted to be a professional basketball player, and I was more interested <laughs> in sports. Too. Can I say hi to the NBA <laughs> later? Uh, oh, yeah. We'll touch base. Uh, <laughs> There's but, still time. But, but no, um, mine was really accidental. My mother passed away in 2002. I was halfway through my undergraduate studies. Um, and really, to honor her legacy, that's the only reason why I decided to do further postgraduate study. Uh, both mum and dad were part of the independence movement uh, back home that took Vanuatu to uh, independence um, from Britain and France. Um, and she was one of the few outspoken feminist voices uh, in the movement. And when she passed away, uh, it, kind of it kind of woke me up to the fact that a lot of those ideas, those really precious ideas around social justice and looking specifically at power structures like male supremacy. Um, in, the, in the climate of the time, they were, they were largely being marginalized and not becoming mainstream anymore. So as a way of honoring her, her life, uh, that's the only reason why I got into doing the PhD. And then I decided to resign last year after about 15 years of teaching, also because I realized education is such an important aspect of addressing ecological crisis, but there are really fundamental problems with the way a lot of our institutions are currently structured. Yeah. It's the compartmentalization of, uh, of disciplines, and also when you learn a discipline, you as an individual, you're not primary. You it's the not to the, be a human. That, that's what we right. were talking about backstage, that's right. right? Yeah, <laughs> so you... I mean, to really deep dive into a discipline, you have to deep dive into yourself first. Um, that's really the primary principle of learning. You have to tap into your own feelings and passions to figure out what you really want yeah. to pursue. And then on that basis, then you can deep dive into these disciplines. So 
So, so how, do you, how do you stay tapped into that when doing climate justice work specifically? Because it is such a hugely systemic set of issues that we're dealing with. How do we stay connected to the version of us that we need to be mm. for to affect change? Well, I can, uh, I can only talk about my experience. We'll just and copy yours, it's fine. <laughs> well, the, the thing that I learned, I mean, when I handed in my resignation notice February last year, I never saw it coming. I just organized this huge, helped organize this huge Pacific Climate Conference uh, over the weekend, and then by the end of the weekend, I, when I was packing up all the boxes, I realized I was going to hand in my notice the next day. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, and it freaked out my family, freaked out a lot of my friends. I was basically walking away from a pretty cushy academic career. Um, but the thing that I realized is, uh, in order for us to address this climate crisis and any other form of major global crisis we face today, it requires the best of ourselves. And sometimes you have to leave the security of whatever role or job or position you're in in order to have the alone time. Yeah. I mean, I basically went and I sat around. Under I, the trees. I went, I went bush. I mean, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a Pacific it, boy. And literally, I'm, I'm, he, went and sat, I, he said that backstage. And I said, wait, literally under trees? He said, yes, literally under trees. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a, being a Pacific boy and a village boy too, I, 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 I just followed my gut. And I knew that I wanted something more than I was able to do at uni. And sitting under the trees, it, it, uh, what came home to me was one of the biggest uh, ways that we disconnect from the natural world, we don't spend enough time. Mm. And you don't have to do fancy stuff, you just sit. And you just sit and sit and sit and then stuff will come to you. And again, all it is is it's giving yourself the time to bring out all those unique gifts and talents that each and every one of us has. Connect to your own spiral connect, pattern. Connect to our own spiral path. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Powell. It's really wonderful to get to hear your story and how you connect all of the threads of your life into this really beautiful tapestry. So thank you for joining thank us. You, Ash. Yeah. And Paula will be with us at the entire <coughs> event as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. So very special guest uh, that I mentioned earlier, and uh, he, f he lost his notes. Um, so the president of the 73rd session of the General Assembly has more than 20 years of experience in international negotiations, peace, security, defense, human rights, disarmament, indigenous peoples, gender equality, biodiversity, and climate change. Another lazy person. She's just got so much. Slacker, really. She has served uh, Ecuador as Minister of Foreign Affairs twice, Minister of National Defense, and coordinating Minister of Natural and Cultural Heritage. Please welcome to the stage a very special keynote speaker, Her Excellency, Miss Maria Fernanda Espinosa Garcia. Thank you so much for this uh, very generous, wonderful introduction. And um, I'm the president of the UN General Assembly, so I'm supposed to be speaking from the podium, very serious and um, older, a little older. But let me start by congratulating the organizers for something that makes me so happy. And it is the sustainability part of this great event. Um, I was really with smiling and happy because the issue of plastic pollution and killing our oceans is a big thing. And this is very much connected to climate change. So when I heard that no straws, no single use plastic bottles, I, I could really breathe and congratulations for that. That is extremely important. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, really, I'm delighted. I'm delighted to be here. 
uh, among so many young leaders uh, from all over the world. And I was thinking, you know, I really hope that you're not thinking, oh, these old ladies standing at the podium, because I think that to be young, to feel young, to think young, is when you have more dreams than memories, and I do have more dreams than memories. And my dreams are about you and with you. So thank you. Thank you for having me here today. So dear YMCA leaders, members, and change agents, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I was asking how many countries are represented here. I was told more than 100. And I, ha I wanted to start by asking a very simple question. Who among you have English as a mother tongue? Well, that's quite a bit, but not all of us. So just, just a gentle reminder that diversity is one of the most precious issues that we have, and multilingualism equally important. It's equally important because, you know, culture, wisdom, everything is conveyed through language. Uh, for me, it is, sometimes it is a little tough to speak, uh, to speak English. My mother tongue is Spanish. I'm uh, the first Latin American woman to be the president of the United uh, <laughs> Nations General Assembly. And I'm very, very happy. But beyond the language barriers, I, I think that we do, we do speak a common language. And it is the language of humanity. So that's what gathers us here today. It is really an honor and a pleasure uh, to be with you today to celebrate the 175th anniversary of the YMCA. I think that the, the energy in this room is fantastic. I was sitting at the front row here and I could just feel it. My heart was beating uh, just listening to the previous speakers. So I don't want to imply in saying this that we don't see the same levels of enthusiasm at the UN in New York. But I am sure my, my dear friend and sister, Jahatma, will agree this is a whole different level of energy, of commitment, of wisdom. Uh, I've just come from a, a brilliant discussion with some youth leaders, and now I see thousands of you from across the world, all committed to making social justice, peace, and equality a true reality. And I am, I have to say, I am already inspired. Over the past few weeks, I have been reading a bit about your history, your roots in this country, your humanitarian work during the First and Second World Wars, your pivotal role in shaping the United Nations from its earliest days in San Francisco in 1945 your contributions to the fight against apartheid and racism in all its forms, your advocacy on the climate crisis, the work you do on the ground to help young people living in poverty with HIV AIDS or without access to quality education or to education, simply put. All of you in this room and many more watching online are part of this history. I commend you and I thank you for what you do every day and for what you have done over these past 175 years. Thank you. <laughs> never, never say never, but this is a true never. Never underestimate your collective power. You have 65 million members. That's basically the population of the UK, which is an influential global player. So are you. You are very powerful. Some of you might be thinking, yeah, that's easy for her to say. But I wasn't born a politician myself. I was like you. Someone working at the community level with persons with disabilities, with refugees and migrants, with indigenous peoples of my country. By working with your communities, you have already taken the first step that I took on my path to the United Nations. 
And you don't need to work for the United Nations to make a difference. You already, already have power. You have power as an activist. You can use your voice like young people across the world have done on climate change, for example. You have power as a citizen. Politicians are more likely to support the Sustainable Development Goals, for instance, if they think their constituents care about them. So you have a very important work to do. You have power as a consumer when it comes to issues, as we just mentioned, issues such as plastic pollution, one of my priorities this year. Your personal choices can shape the behavior of companies. I am proud, for example, that we recently made the UN headquarters single-use plastic free. I thought it was an impossible endeavor, but we really needed to walk the talk on that. And I had a great ally when I said no more single-use plastics at the UN. It's really embarrassing. I had a great ally, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres. And now if you go, come to New York, which I hope you do, you will see that we are a single-use plastic-free environment. So, and whatever path you choose, and we have heard here for incredible youth leaders, doctor or data analyst, engineer, entrepreneur, biologist, blogger, poet, or parent, you can contribute to a safer, fairer, and more sustainable world. Dear friends, dear youth leaders, we have come a long way since the YMCA was founded in 1844. Back then, only a handful of countries had a life expectancy of over 40. Today, the global average is over 70 years. Since 1945, when the UN was established, we have seen dramatic reductions in poverty and the elimination of, of smallpox. We have seen women gain suffrage in virtually all countries and gender gap close, close in primary and secondary education, at least at the global level. And the UN has been a key part of that story. Through its peacekeeping missions, through its humanitarian agencies that feed, shelter, and protect millions of people every day. I recently visited the Zaatari camp in Jordan, which was a profoundly humbling experience. And though its role as a convener and a platform for states to adopt the Paris Climate Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals, we have the potential to transform our world and save humanity. We must never forget these achievements when we hear the UN criticized for, for being a talk shop. Apart from anything else, talking is very important. We need to talk more, of course, but we also need to listen. As a poet myself, I am convinced of the power of words, of dialogue, of diplomacy. This is our work, our job. But as you all know, that is only part of the story. Across the world, too many people have been left behind. 600 million young people a third of the total youth population live in fragile and conflict-affected areas. Young people make up a third of those unemployed globally. And over the next decade or so, we will need to create roughly 40 million jobs per year just to keep pace with the growing populations. 40 million jobs every year. 15 million girls give birth each year. 15 million girls give birth each year, often due to barriers in accessing information and health services. 150 million young people have disabilities. Many of them face severe social and economic disparities in poor and rich countries. Every five seconds, a child dies, mostly from preventable diseases. 
every five seconds. And too many young people feel their best hope for a better future is to move from rural to urban areas or across borders, often risking their own lives. And the gains we have made over the past 70 years are now at risk. Multiple crises, environmental, political, economic, and social, are driving conflict and instability around the world. If carbon emissions don't peak next year, the climate crisis will lead to even greater chaos. These problems do not respect borders. They cannot be contained by walls. Today, a drought in Asia could lead to soaring food prices in Africa. A market crash in Europe could precipitate a global economic downturn. Our world is getting smaller. Clearly, we need more cooperation, not less. But at a time when the case for multilateralism should be obvious, we are witnessing a rise of nationalist sentiment. Across the world, many governments are turning inwards, too preoccupied with domestic problems to invest in the global solutions we need. Some are actively trying to undermine our international order or to exploit the legitimate grievances of those disadvantaged by unchecked globalization. People, meanwhile, are losing faith in the ability of institutions to keep them safe and improve their lives. So what can we do? We can use our collective power. Whatever our differences, all of us want the same things out of life, more or less. A safe place to live, enough food to eat, a good education, a clean environment, access to health care, the freedom and the opportunities to be who we want to be. And the good news is we have in the Sustainable Development Goals a blueprint for achieving that vision if only, and it's a big if, we can all work together. And that is where you come in again. This is, you are, the largest generation of young people in history. Between now and 2030, the deadline we have set ourselves for achieving the SDGs, half the world population will be under 30. Many politicians see this as a problem. And yes, it is not without challenges, many of which you are actively discussing the future of work, for example, but this is also a great opportunity. Your generation is highly educated and creative. You are willing to take risks and to challenge received wisdom. You were born as global citizens of an increasingly interconnected world. You understand better than some policymakers that the problems we face cannot be solved by one government or indeed by governments alone. You are instinctively multilateral. We cannot afford to exclude you from decision making. We cannot afford to have you as our partners on the ground. We cannot, we cannot afford not to have you as our partners on the ground. As president of the General Assembly at the UN, I tried hard to ensure that young people are involved in our work. I know that Jahadma is doing everything she can to make the UN less gray, but there is so much more we could do. Dear friends, ladies and, le and gentlemen, the challenge I set for my presidency was to make the United Nations more relevant to people, and I ask you for your help. We need your solutions from the challenges we face. We need you to spread the word about the SDGs, and we need you to challenge us, to give us your ideas on how to make the UN more effective, more inclusive, more transparent, and more accountable. Next year, 
the UN will turn 75. And governments have agreed to mark this anniversary not by uh, looking back, but, but by looking forward. There will be a youth forum next year to discuss the future we want and the UN we need. The outcomes will, we, will be presented to world leaders at the anniversary summit in September 2020. Here's a wonderful opportunity for YMCA and for all of you. And if you are thinking, well, I'm not going to be able to go to New York, the UN will be initiating dialogues on this theme around the world, and I very much hope that YMCA globally, nationally, and locally will be part of that conversation. Finally, I am very aware that if we are asking you to do all these things, we also need to do more to empower you. That is why my constant refrain to government is, change the narrative on youth, from one of problems to one of opportunity. Integrate national youth policies into broader development plans and civic, political, and economic, economic activities. And boost funding for youth programs. In nearly all countries, the youth sector is underfunded. This includes youth ministries as well as youth organization networks. We need to invest in the capacities, agency, and leadership of young people, even as we call on them, on you, to work with us to address global challenges. My dear friends, at the UN, we often quote former UN Secretary General Doug Hammarskjöld, who said, the UN was not created to take us to heaven, but to save us from hell. These words are meant to serve as a bit of a reality check, but whenever I, he I, hear, I hear them, I think we can do better, you can do better. So I wish you all the best for the coming days and for the future. We are counting on you, and thank you once again for having me. Happy 175th anniversary to the YMCA. Thank you. Madam President. Please, can we show our rousing appreciation for Madam President? Well, what an amazing way to end our opening plenary. Some important announcements if you are rushing out for workshops. There are a few uh, opportunities that I would like to highlight for you. At 2 p.m. there will be the flagship environment panel in this room. Food is currently being served in the South Catering Hall, which is just behind us up the escalators. Don't forget about the open space. That's an incredibly interactive dialogue for you on floor three where you can bring the issues you want to talk about and debate. Ah, important. The MBA will be in the health and well-being area, which yes. is open now. Practice my shot. And uh, translation team, if you want support with translation during the workshops, there is a translation desk on level three. Three, yeah. Yeah, level three. And I think I've, I've got, someone will tell me I've forgotten something <laughs> as soon as I come off stage. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all so much. Enjoy lunch. Enjoy the rest of your day. And I'm going to go back to being an event manager. Go back to being an event manager. Go manage an event, <laughs> would you? <ya? laughs>